Um, it's my pleasure to start a new series of, uh, of topics in, uh, in this class. If I connect. Okay, so uh, what we have done so far, uh, actually the, there are three parts of the class. I'm only showing here uh, two of them. The first uh, bullet that's missing out there was this uh, crash intro to web apps with you know, CSS, JavaScript, uh, backend, and, uh, and the Smile project. And what we, we're kind of done with that. Then I transitioned uh, at the higher level of abstraction, discussing some more abstract uh, topics about software engineering that I thought would help you frame your big semester project, like uh, software processes, uh, how do you collect and express requirements, specification, de design, we talked about uh, UML, and that was kind of a six, actually maybe a little bit less, uh, four or five lectures of that. And uh, with that, I think you should be able to get started on your big uh, project. And at this point, we will diverge a little bit between what you're doing on your semester project and what we're doing in lecture. Because uh, all of you will use some UML, some use cases. That will be common, but you'll be going on different directions because of the topics of your projects. What I want to uh, shift the lectures to now is uh, general techniques that I expect many, if not all, teams will use, and techniques that I found to be very useful in, in practice. So this series of lectures that come next, maybe about uh, uh, eight lectures or so, are all distilled from my experience in, in industry. So uh, most of those topics are not esoteric academic topics, but they are really things that uh, you can use in your day-to-day -day work to make your work uh, more effective as a software engineer. I will start with uh, two lectures on version control. And then uh, five lectures or so, four or five lectures on, on testing. I'm very big on testing, and I think it's the one thing that can make your software stand out in terms of quality and your life as a software engineer stand out. Uh, and then at the end, we have a number of lectures uh, that are more advanced topics about uh, deploying uh, software as a service, uh, security, deployment, and monitoring. But I will really only scratch the surface on, on that aspect. Uh, testing will do pretty in-depth in version control. Uh, I think uh, we'll get to some advanced topics. But for the rest, kind of we're at the end of the semester, so there's not uh, much time left. OK, version control. So this is a brand new set of a uh, couple of lectures. And um, I have spent last week putting them together. And I, I'm. Uh, if I can say so, I'm pretty pleased how they come up, but I'm very curious what your feedback is going to be. Because I know that all of you have used version control. So the question is, why, why do we need one or two lectures about version control? Um, well, there are some basic concepts that uh, I assume you know. I will review them only as much as uh, I want to, f to introduce a, a certain way of discussing uh, version control which we'll then use for more advanced uh, topics. Why even teach uh, this stuff? So at Conviva, uh, when we started uh, eight years ago, we were using Subversion. And I was kind of the de facto person of setting up uh, the process for using version control across branches, releases, and such, and building tools that use Subversion. Uh, and then at some point, maybe four years ago, we transitioned to Git. It was a pretty big uh, transition from Subversion uh, to Git. We managed to do it, but what I've discovered by learning Git in depth and seeing how people use it, a lot of people can use Git superficially. Uh, and once in a while, they get into trouble because they want to do something a little bit more complicated. And they either waste time, a lot of time, because they don't know how to use it, or simply they can't do the job. So uh, what I would like to do in these two lectures, I'm hoping that. Uh, maybe 25% uh, of the material is going to be reviewed, but 75% um, you're going to learn some more advanced techniques for how to use Git. Uh, Git is a, is a monster of a tool. It's really uh, incredibly complex. Uh, I would even say unnecessarily complex. Um, I, I don't know it 100%, uh, and there's still stuff for me, for me to learn. And I think it's worthwhile to actually learn a little bit more in depth. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's get going. I'm going to rely on you to raise your hand and stop me 
if you think I'm going too fast, because I am assuming some of the stuff you've known. So version control, uh, you've used it. Um, it's used to track different releases of your software, different versions of your software, the evolution of your software. And uh, in an extreme, there have been version control systems in the past that surreptitiously would kind of create a version while you're typing, okay, without you explicitly creating a version. So that's kind of the ultimate in, in tracking history of what you've done, every edit, okay? That's not what Git does. Git uh, requires some manual intervention and decision for one to create versions. But in an extreme, this is version control. Let me uh, open it up to you now uh, as a wake up uh, question. Uh, what, what have you used version control for? What kind of uh, benefits have you gotten out of version control as opposed to just editing you know, in a, with your editor and sending files around by email? Which is what students in 169 used to do about 10 years ago. Um, so in one of my classes, we were passing 19 out of 20 tests. Like we were almost there. And we started making edits to get the last test to go, but it ended up breaking a lot of other tests. And thanks to Git, we were able to go back to the previous one. And we weren't able to manually fix it, I guess. So Git was able to put us back to a good place. Again. Good. So going back, reverting to a, a, a point in the past. This is live saving. Yes, other things. Right, working on multiple features at once. And also in the spirit of concurrent working, um, working on multiple versions at once. But within a company, it's going to be a team that's working on fixing the previous release, another team working on preparing the next release. Only one place. Other things? Have you used Git Blame? What for? Not to blame, of course, but what do you use it for? See if you edited something. To see, so with git blame, you can you can look at a piece of code and say this looks strange. Why was this written here? So you can run git blame and tells you exactly which revision this line was last edited. You can look at the comments and maybe find out from the comments why was it even put there, who, when, and why. Okay, or you find a bug and you wonder when was this introduced. You go to the history. Okay, lots of lots of good uses. So. Uh, I have my own list here. Compare the current version with older. I tend to commit very frequently, very frequently, every 15 minutes or so. This gives me a, a safety net. I can only lose 15 minutes worth of work. I can go back. And then I can, if somehow I've regressed, it doesn't work as well as 15 minutes ago, I can quickly find out what I've changed in the last 15 minutes, or the last half an hour, or an hour or so. Uh, revert an older version, as was pointed out. Concurrent, uh, blame. Okay, these are all good uses for version control. So let's go on to uh, some basics of uh, Git. Most of what I will describe in these lectures are, are specific to Git. And then at the end of uh, next lecture, I'll, I'll kind of come and compare Git with some other systems that you may, may be using in your work. OK, I want to introduce some notation that I will use uh, many, many times in this, uh, in this slide. And uh, it's color coded. and. It's all kind of uniform, but we need to introduce it. So first, there's going to be a notion of a working directory, which I'll use this green um, disk-like uh, symbol with the label W for a working directory. This is really the directory structure where you have all the files of your project. Uh, this is where you make the edits, OK? As opposed to the repository, which also happens to be stored on disk, but conceptually it's separate. The repository, it's a database of sorts. We're not going to really discuss how it's stored internally, although I invite you to look. It's really an amazing uh, data structure if you look at it. Uh, but think about it that it's a set of commits, which I, I'll be representing with this uh, orange uh, bullets there. And the commits, each commit is really a snapshot in time of the contents of the working directory along with uh, some meta information, like uh, the date when it was snapshotted, the author who made the snapshot, and the message that the author wrote. Okay? That's all represented by this blob, and it's stored somewhere in the database. And next, uh, these blobs, these commits, have a 
uh, parent-child relationship. So I'll be using these arrows pointing to the parent. Okay? So this came first, and then this commit came next. Okay? Uh, so this is how you should think about uh, git commits. Uh, it's a, essentially a graph of snapshots. And uh, we'll see that it's a graph because you could have multiple children for one parent. You could also um, have multiple parents for one child. So it's, it's not a tree, it's really a graph. To be more specific, it's, a, it's an acyclic graph. Uh, the other thing I want to, uh, to point out is that this, if this represents a snapshot, you should think of these edges as a difference between a snapshot or a set of changes. Okay? So to get from this parent to this child, I've changed file foo to add a line, I've deleted for file bar, and it's all a bunch of changes, which is what you know how to get with git diff. Git diff essentially describes these, uh, these edges. Okay? And the repository, it's simply the collection of these, uh, of these commits with their uh, relationships. Any, any questions? Okay. So I'll be, you'll be seeing you know, a lot of these uh, diagrams um, on, the, on the board. Next, Git has a very peculiar way of naming these, uh, these uh, commits. And uh, what it does, it computes a hash function uh, specifically a SHA-1 hash function of the contents of all of the files in all of the directories at that point in time, and also along with the metadata, the author, the data, and the message of the commit, and also the list of hashes of the parents. <coughs> okay? So in some way, this, uh, and this is a 40-character uh, number. It's a pretty ugly, long name that you've seen. And the idea is that this is a pretty unique representation of the identity of the snapshot. The contents of the files, the message, the date, the author, and where it is in the graph by indirectly including the parents. Okay? So if I take the same snapshot, the same contents of the file, make another commit with another date, maybe another author, maybe another message, it creates another node with another name. If I take the same contents and put, have a different parent, it will have another name. Okay, so pretty much this is very important. In Git, if you change anything about one of these snapshots, the contents of a file or the message or the parents, it's going to get a new node in the graph. This is, this is crucial for you to understand because it's going to be a lifesaver. You'll see. Any questions about this? No? Okay, you've seen these names, I'm sure. Uh, the other thing you should understand that uh, because these names are definitely not human friendly, Git has a bunch of mechanisms to help us use them. One of them is that it tries to be smart, and as long, uh, it knows all of the names in your database, in your repository. As long as you use a prefix of this name that's unique within your database, it's going to accept it. It's going to complete it to the full name and work with it. Typically, the first five letters are uh, what you need. What I often do, I take the mouse and the copy uh, a prefix of 5 to 8 to 10, however I feel like I copy my commands. Okay? Um, okay, moving along then, if there are no questions. To make it even more human friendly, Git maintains so called refs or references. So the repository, along with the database of, let's say we have five nodes with this kind of parent relationships, maintains a table with pointers into this graph. And these are the Git references, and they're typically human-friendly names that you gave to various nodes in the graph. Okay. So really, uh, we will have this table always on our slide uh, that's a table of references. And the way they are represented, if you're curious, you go look in the .git uh, directory, in your working directory. That's where Git stores all of its data, uh, the entire database and this table. And you will see a directory called refs. And if you go and scan it, you will see that it has like new, and it contains the long 40 uh, character hash of D. All contains the hash of E. Yours contains the hash of A. Okay? 
And in my slides, I won't use these long names. I'll just use single letter names uh, for the commits. That's how I will refer to the commits. So branches are really references. You may have used tags, git tags, a similar concept to branches. They are references. Okay? And we will see that there are mechanisms for us to add names, to change names in the table, and to change where this pointers point. When you, uh, because of this table, git now allows you to refer to a particular node in multiple ways. You can refer to this node by its long 40 character name or a prefix of it. You can refer to the same node, let's say E, with the name old. Because when it sees something, when, when, you, when you use a name uh, for a reference to, the, to, to your commits, it first looks up in the refs table to see if that name is defined, and then finds out what it's defined to. Okay? <clears throat> any, any questions? Yes? Are these automatically generated by Git, or do you assign reference? No, these are all human generated. There's only one name that Git will automatically generate just to get you started. It's called master. The first thing I do, I delete it. Uh, because it's really there to get you started. I don't use master in my workflow. I use, I use other kinds of names like trunk and release 2.5. I don't need master, so I delete it. Uh, but these will all will generate them. Um, OK? So there's one more thing I need to tell you about the, the <coughs> reference table. There is a very special reference called head with capital uh, letters. and. Uh, this is a marker for what is the currently checked out reference in your working directory. Okay, so let me explain that. Uh, notice here in this diagram that we have this uh, repository, and the working directory contains D. It's the same snapshot that, as here. Perhaps this is the state after you have just committed your working directory to, to the repository, or perhaps you have just checked it out. Okay. Git needs to know not only where you are in this graph, um, but what is the, so that's node D, but what is the current branch? Uh, what is the current reference for your node? So notice the head does not point to the graph directly. It points to one of the other names. So this says, this, and this is an arrow here, uh, this says that New is the current branch, and new says I'm currently at D. So indirectly, you're saying two things. I, uh, the currently checked out version is D, and I'm on the current branch new. Okay? So this is important. Head does not normally point in the graph. Head points to revision here. It's going to be very important for how these things uh, change. Now, you can refer to D in several ways. You can use it, its uh, hash uh, name, D. You can call it new, or you can call it head. And Git will figure it out by following these pointers to figure out where it is. Questions? Okay, so head is a special name that Git will manipulate for us. The others we will manipulate directly or indirectly uh, ourselves. Okay, um, can I move on? Yes. If we rename the new branch, will head still point to whatever we renamed it to? Uh, yes, if you rename the new branch. Um, so head is manipulated indirectly, implicitly, by some of the commands that Git uh, does. And I'll show you. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind, and it's going to be on all of my slides there to see how it works. OK, so now let's look at various commands and what they do to uh, this data structure. Um, I will first talk about committing changes. Uh, so my slides are organized as follows. I start with a state before the, the operation that we're discussing. This is the state before. It's a ref table, the working directory, and the repo, okay, the state before. And I will have a slide showing the state before and a scenario that tries to say, we're trying to do this. Um, because typically you use Git to solve some uh, development or maintenance uh, problem. So I'll try to refer the problem to something that's a little bit higher level than, than Git details. The scenario in this case is that um, you have checked out D because head points to D, and then you have made some changes in the working directory. 
So the state of the work injected now is F. And uh, you decide that F is something you'd like to save for the future. Uh, perhaps so that you can come back to it or, or uh, whatever. So you want to add another node to the graph with F. And the parent is going to be D because F is a change made on top of D. D was the previously checked out version on top of which you've made your changes. So you want that reflected in the history, which is, uh, you know, which this graph represents. Okay? So this is the operation called commit. You've all used committing. Uh, okay, so now I need to uh, get back to the, um, I'll describe the, what commit does. But because this is the first operation I'm describing for Git, I want to lay out a little bit the conventions. So down here in this white box, I'm going to write the actual command I'm running to achieve the, to implement the scenario from the previous slide. And uh, so that's the command, or some version of the command. And here, I will try to be uh, precise to explain the branch we're on. Because Git commands behave differently depending on what branch you run them on. So, uh, and by the way, you, you run all of these commands as shell commands in your working directory. But the working directory has a notion of what is the current branch. And the way it knows that, it goes in this ref table, looks at head, and see what head points to. So new is the current uh, working branch. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to show you state before, command. And then on the right, I'm going to sh show you the state after this command, OK? Um, and both the state before and after will share the same ref table. So what I'm showing here is that after running the git command, I've added another node to my graph called f. It has the same contents as the working directory from before. So now the working directory and the, the head, the top of the current branch, have the same concept. Uh, notice that the old pointer points to E, as before, hasn't changed. Head still points to new, because new continues to be the current branch, but new has advanced. Used to point to D, now points to F. Okay? So the reason, when you do a commit, both head and new <coughs> change, point to different things. But the way this happens is because Head still points to new. There's an indirect reference here. New is the one that changes. And this is important because you could have multiple names pointing to the same node in the graph. Nobody prevents you from having another entry here, say, my branch pointed to D. Only new will be advanced. Not all of the names that point to D. Only the current branch, which head points to it. Yes? So the table in the middle, those are names of these are, uh, this, Git calls them reps, references. They could be branches, they could be tags, they could be any name you decide to give. Don't think in terms of branches. Branches are a misnomer in Git. These are names, human readable names that you gave to some nodes in the graph. But each node is a commit? Each node is a commit. So, you're, so if you change what new points to you, you're renaming your different you, you're, you're, well, this is a, imagine like it's like a pointer. You set the pointer to point to something else. But yeah, you could say that you rename it. Uh, you, you change the meaning of the name if you want. Yeah. Okay. You, you can never rename these things. These are based on the contents of the commit. Those never change. This you can point to different places. And in fact, you achieve a lot of the power of Git by manipulating this table. So when you do add and when you do push, how exactly it? When you do what? Add and push, how exactly does that reflect the graph we're looking at? Okay, so you mentioned git add. This is something that I'm completely glossing over. Uh, there's another level of detail in git. It's, it's a data structure that sits in between your working directory and the repository. It's called the index. And that's what git add um, does. I'm not going to talk about git add. Git push is a different concept um, that talks about remote repositories. I do not use git add. What I do, all of my git commits have a dash am, which means add and commit. So essentially, I'm always bypassing the index. It's not part of my workflow. And you can like specify in the am also that 
to the files you want to add to that commit? Well, uh, I add everything that I've changed. Okay. That's my workflow. Sometimes when I create a new file, I add a new file to my project, I have to do git add by hand. But that, from that moment on, any new changes to that file, I, uh, I just commit everything that I've changed in the working directory uh, gets committed. I didn't want to confuse you with the index as well, because it is confusing. Okay, any, any other questions here? Okay, so the workflow then, you take, make more edits here, work, uh, work directory changes, do another commit, and the graph grows. Okay, so uh, and notice it has the lineage, the parenthood, you know all the versions by following the parent point. Um, the other thing I want to point out is use git log. If now I run git log without specifying a commit, by default it uh, uses head. So it will see where head points to and it will follow all the parent pointers. That's what git log will give you. Uh, you will skip E. You will not get to E, even though it's in the database because it's not part of the parent chain. Okay, moving along. Um, I want to uh, spend a couple of slides on good practices. You've all made commits, you've all made uh, git commit messages, and I'm sure some of them said block or true, <coughs> or you tried even the empty commit, but git didn't let you, so you have to put a character in there, right? Um, in general, it's in the, uh, the commit message is very important formation for the history of your project, because people will go back to it to see who changed this line and why and when, and then they'll go here to read the description of why that change is. And let me tell you that different companies, different teams have different uh, conventions. I'll describe one that we use at Conviva. Um, so we structure the log messages into two main parts, the first line and the rest. The first line is important because there are many tools that will only show the first line. For example, email messages. If your Git repository is set up to send an email for every commit, this is going to be the subject line of the message. Okay, so think of it as the subject line in an email message. Um, we actually have a structure um, here. Uh, we start with this thing in square brackets where we name the part of the project. And Conviva works on, um, we have a team of 50 engineers or so, we work on 20, 30 components. Okay. We list here the components that are touched. Uh, that makes it visually easy to kind of spot where this change may be in the project. Okay, So let's say I've changed the model, as in a model view controller, and then the, the subject line. We have an empty line here for a visual effect. Um, so again, this, this line just formatted for the, as for the email subject. The other thing we list in the commit message is the bug number that it, this is being worked on. Many of your commits are in response to an issue that was filed in your issue tracker database. And we have a, we have a certain convention um, that we can mention the bug number here. And in fact, if you use GitHub and if you use this sharp sign with the number, GitHub will automatically try to interpret that number as a reference to your issues. So GitHub has issues, maybe you've seen, that you can use as issue tracker. And if this number matches the ID of an issue, uh, you're going to have a link there. When you look at the Git history, you can click on it, takes you to the issue. On the issue, you can click and takes you to the commit. So it kind of links them together for cross reference Very, very useful. Uh, at Conviva, we use a code review system that's outside of our um, Git uh, repository. And we write there the ID of the code review issue and who we ask to review this code. In case issues come up with this commit, uh, that's a further thing that you can go and see the discussion that there was around this. Uh, companies like, uh, and, then, and then there's a longer text where you can you know, explain more at length uh, what this is about. And again, do it as if this is part of the archive history of your project. Don't write just blah. There. You're going to be ashamed of it later. And uh, it gets hard to change after a while. I'll show you why. Um, be, uh, okay, what else? Uh, okay. So uh, companies like uh, Google. Google, from the very first, uh, uh, from the very beginning of the company, they had the culture of code reviews. You could not commit without the code review. In fact, nowadays, your commit 
doesn't even go to the shared repository until it's committed, tested, all that. Then it gets committed automatically by a tool. After uh, after the people who you ask to, to review have uh, have closed the, the review. Okay. At Conviva, we don't have that kind of enforcement. We rely more on a uh, on discipline and process. Okay. Uh, moving along. I have a, a, a few uh, more pieces of advice about uh, committing. The most important one, commit often. Version control is your friend. Everything that you commit is safe. Stuff that you don't commit, uh, you may lose. Um, so, for example, you may work on a feature or a bug fix, and as you go through, you notice another bug. Okay, you are tempted to fix it because you are there anyway. Try not to do that. Try to have logically uh, standalone issues in one commit. So even if that means you make three commits within a minute, uh, that's okay because they each have their own message, their own reason why they exist. Um, that actually it's, it's, it's big because then you can manipulate them independently. You can pick them, you can revert them if you need so. Um, Commit often locally. There's no harm in making many commits. Again, I make commits every 15 minutes. I don't even write much in terms of messages because I will come back and clean them up later before I package this for archival, for sharing. Okay? Uh, stuff that you do not commit, you may overwrite. Make a mistake in an editor and delete stuff. And your editor, let's say, doesn't have a good undo, it's gone. Okay? You may want to say, oh, 15 minutes ago, uh, it worked. Now it doesn't work. What had to change? You can't answer that question unless you have committed. So commit often. Uh, one theme of my presentation about Git is that if it's in the repo, we can get it back. Even though it seems sometimes that Git loses it, it's still there. Uh, we'll learn ways to kind of uh, unearth old stuff uh, from the Git repo. But if it's not in the repo, you may lose it. However, because you commit very often, drafts, stuff that's not fully worked, we will need mechanisms to clean up, to go and undo commits, redo commits, move them around, combine them, change them, okay? And that's part of the advanced topics I want to, I want to teach you. People who don't feel confident that they can clean up, rearrange stuff, they don't commit. They wait to commit until they think they finish the feature. <coughs> well, if that takes three days uh, to finish the feature and your computer you know, catches fire in them, and then uh, you, you lost your work. Okay, so let's go learn some techniques about correcting uh, commits, undoing, fixing commits. There's many ways in Git in which you can uh, change your mind about how the commit data structure looks like. I've split them into two big chunks uh, because I, I thought it flows, it flows better. So again, now we're gonna have a series of techniques each one with two slides. On the first slide, I show you the initial state and the justification of what we're trying to do. In the second slide, I show you the git command and the final state to achieve that. So the first one I want to show you, it's called amend, or git amend. Uh, so you have one branch called new, uh, and let's say a linear sequence of uh, steps. Notice that you've made some changes uh, in your working directory. <coughs> And let's say you decide that this commit D was premature. You should not have made it. Um, you want to combine all of the changes from C to D with the changes you've just made in the working directory. Okay? Let's say you've just committed, and then say, oops, I, I forgot to, uh, um, to delete this line or fix this comment. You fix this comment, so now the working directory is different from the commit, and you say, I want to redo this commit to include my changes. Okay? Um, or perhaps you made a mistake in the message of D. You want to re get a chance to rewrite the message of D. And that's the command git amend. Really, it's, it's, a, it's an option to commit it. So amending <coughs> is done by committing with the dash dash amend uh, parameter. And now, let's look at what happens. Uh, what git will do is say, oh, you want to redo this commit. Well, git cannot change commits in place. Remember, this commit has a hash code that completely determines its content, message, parents, everything. So that cannot be changed. But what it can do, it can go back to its parent C and create another commit. 
with the same parent. So F now, which matches your working directory, includes all of the changes from C to D and D to F, all packaged as one arrow from C to F. And this is how you get this kind of structure with a new node on top of a previous parent. New now moves from D to F, and uh, W is your working directory. If you, if you run git log now, you will think that nothing has changed because you will see F, C, B, A. But you may notice that the hash code of F is different than what you had before. You won't even see D when you run git log. It seems like it has disappeared. Well, it has not. This is very important. D was in the repo, it's still there. It's just you don't have a name to it. But it's still a, it's still a node in your graph. Any questions? How many of you have used uh, git commit? Okay, so I'm glad I'm, I'm at least teaching you something here. Um, so what do you want to delete D? Do I want to delete D? Don't rush into deleting D. It takes some space there, and once a month or so, you'll notice git will run something called a garbage collection. And uh, that's when it deletes all the nodes that you cannot reach from the reference table. Like D will be a candidate. But don't delete it just yet. It may save a lot of work because you may discover, oops, I don't want to do that. I want D again. I want D back. There's a way to get it back. Um, but don't, don't, don't run git garbage <coughs> like by, by yourself. OK? An important point here, git never deletes stuff, only adds stuff to the graph. OK? It replaces stuff, but not in place. It creates a copy. Because of this, there's going to be a way to recover your work. So it's very safe. You can go back to pretty much any state you want. Um, so I have a question. You said I want to merge not only D and F. I want to merge from C. C, D, F. Yeah. So uh, how, how can I write the command? This achieves that. So because this edge, F is this state F. So this edge is all the changes from C to F which includes C to D and D to F. Oh, I mean, I want, like, from B. I want B. You want from B? Yeah. OK, uh, there's, there's, there's other commands that we're going to oh, get to okay. as soon. OK, uh, amend only touches the topmost commit. It's, um, it's a way to kind of redo the last commit. Sometimes I commit. I don't make any changes. Say, oops, I want to change the message. You run the same command, git commit dash m amend. And you have an option to change the message to create another node like this. Yeah. If few of us working on the same branch, and then someone you know goes through uh, a man and then pushes the stuff, when I'm pulling, I'll be able to see D, uh, even though it was done on someone else's computer. No, no. So uh, by the way, all of these changes to the graphic that I'm telling you about, you should try not to do on commits that you have pushed. The the workflow is mostly. Uh, I work locally and I make commits every 15 minutes and I accumulate a bunch of 10 commits. And then I start massaging them, rearranging them, and then I push them. After you push them, it's best not. But if you were to push, D, D would not be pushed. <coughs> so let's take a break now. Um, and uh, I have a little uh, puzzle, which is actually from an actual interview that happened uh, at uh, YouTube uh, two weeks ago, a friend of mine. So. I want to think about this.
So we're still officially in the break, but uh, we can discuss this further with you. Go on. The question is, what is the total bytes of the played video? You can find that out. Is the question clear? You know that when the video player runs out of bytes, it puts out that kind of waiting thing, which a lot of studies have shown that put people off a lot and they might give up and move away and therefore not see the ads. So companies like YouTube care a lot that that doesn't happen. Sometimes the network is just not, your network at home is not fast enough to get this high definition video. So they sometimes prefer to wait a little bit at the beginning of the video such that the rest of the experience is flawless. Maybe they might even show you an ad. I was wondering, how come like, ads sometimes run flawlessly when you're in the internet, but then like, the actual thing you're trying to watch? The, the ads, how come the ads run flawless? They have better servers for ads. No, they don't have better servers. Because you services like uh, Okay, so your point is that the ad might be more local. The ads are also uh, lower definition, typically. Oh, really? So, yeah. Um, and, and in fact, they, they may pre-cache the ads uh, at the edges of the network. They might not know exactly what video everybody wants to watch, but they'll prepare, prepare some of the ads. Um, so, anybody has uh, any thoughts? Uh, L times P minus D over P. So, your, uh, oh, let me see, L times? Uh, P minus D, uh, P minus D together, right, and over P. Maybe. Uh, how, how did you come up with this? Yeah, uh, I saw the I saw the equation that length times p is equal to length times p minus x times p, and that x is the thing. Is equal to uh, l times p. No, no, sorry, l times d is equal to l times p uh, minus x times p. Right, and I, that x is the time we want to like create the okay, yeah. So the, okay, I let, other thoughts? Um, what I got was the time is P times L divided by D, and then minus L. Um, yes. It's a, almost the same. <coughs> Almost the same, but it's fine. Um, okay, other answers? But at least dimensionally, this is seconds, because these are uh, bit rates. L over D. L over D is bytes, right? Yes. And P is bytes per second. This doesn't look right. Because this gets byte square per second, doesn't look like the right one. Okay, so, uh, yes? Same as? P? As this one? Didn't I just. L is seconds. Oh, so seconds square over bytes. Times bytes per second. Times bytes per second. Okay, it's, yeah. dimensionally it's correct. Uh, I apologize. Okay, so we have two votes for this. Um, one way to think about it is that um, this is time. 
And this is how much you've downloaded. Okay? So you download at this rate. And this is how long it takes you uh, to download the last byte. So at this time, the last byte arrives. And this is uh, uh, how much is um, length over, uh, let's see. This is the length of the video in bytes. It's, um, it's D times uh, L, L times P. So this is L times P. So the time here is going to be L times P, the number of bytes divided by the download speed. Can you even see this? Probably not. So this is the, this is the time when the last byte arrives. And you have to time it such that playing starts somewhere here. And by the time the last byte is played, it's exactly when the last byte arrives. So this is L. So essentially, you have to start L seconds before the bust, before the time when the last byte will arrive. Because if you start L seconds, the video takes L seconds to play. When it tries to play the last byte, that's exactly when it arrives. If you start earlier, you'll be buffering. If you start later, you are wasting the user's time. And I think it's, this is the answer. OK. Um, Moving on, back to Git. How do we get access to the video uh, puzzle collection? Oh, that's secret. I can uh, uh, I can give you the whole puzzle collection, but I can uh, um, if you want remind me to post this on, on on asking you. But this is actually very very recent stuff. So moving along. Um, the other thing you may want to do, also in the spirit that well, you've changed your mind, you want to clean up a little bit of history, uh, the scenario is that you had D checked out, and uh, you made some changes, and uh, you want to save these changes in the repository, <coughs> but you decide that you don't want to save them on top of D, because maybe these changes deserve to go on another branch or somewhere else. You don't want to put them on top of D. Let's say... Um, so one thing you can do is you can uh, you can change this new pointer to point somewhere else, okay? Because remember, the uh, head points to the current branch, and the current branch points to the commit that will be the parent <coughs> when you commit. If I were to commit now, I would create another node on top of D. I don't want that. Let's say I want to create on top of, of D or, or C. Um, sorry. So the, there's the reset command. Reset command is simply moving, reassigning this reference uh, to C, the one I made here. So notice that the only thing that changed, working directory hasn't changed, graph hasn't changed, just this edge, instead of pointing to D, points to C. Now if you run a git diff, you will compare E with C. So in, in, in your diff, we'll, you'll see all the changes that you made to D plus the changes that you made uh, to E. If you were to commit now, you'd be making a, uh, a commit on top of C, because that's your current head. D is, in fact, not reachable anymore. It's still there, but it's not reachable. So this is a little bit like uh, undoing. So if you make a git commit, and then you change your mind, git reset, um, and the parent of the commit, it's essentially undoing the commit. The same as stash, I guess? I, I, you do stash? No, it's not the same as stash. No, stash is about saving the working directory. This is really undoing the last commit. Um, so it's a little bit, you can use it for the same reasons as you use amend, for example. Uh, you want to redo D, but to also contain E as well. So you made some more changes on top of uh, of D, but you don't want two commits, D and E. You want just one commit directly from C to E. And uh, you do that by uncommitting, and then the dip is uh, from C to E, and then you commit. Yeah. 
well, you're mentioning rebasing. Um, th those are all multiple ways uh, to do it. In some way, if you're not sure of your Git skills, commit first. Okay. Once it's in the repo, there's no way to lose that. You can always come back. If you screw up some Git command, you can always come back to where you want. So in some, that sense, it's safer. But if you know what git reset does, it simply changes this pointer from new. It doesn't touch anything else. It just moves the pointer a little bit. Um, now, the effects may be big in the sense that if you run a git diff now, you see a lot of differences because the differences are going to be from C to E, from the current head uh, to E. Um, the advantage of this command as opposed to amend, amend only touches the first uh, the, the last commit, uh, redo, redoes the last commit. <coughs> amend is like a reset here and the commit. It's only one. Reset is kind of the first half of that. First moves the pointer, and you can move it anywhere in the graph. So you have your current <coughs> working directory. You say, I don't want to put it on this branch. I want to put another branch. You do a reset to the other branch, and bam, you put it there with a separate git command. Any Any questions? <coughs> Okay, that's my next slide, what the reset heart. Reset is an advanced command. Most Git tutorials will say, don't even go there. Don't do reset because you're going to screw up. And that's, I think, um, fine advice for people who don't want to learn what uh, reset does. If you learn the tool, it's going to save, it's going to give you flexibility. Um, okay, moving along. There's another form of reset that's more powerful and more dangerous as well. Let's say that uh, you've, uh, you have these commits and you've made some further changes in your working directory. So you're at F now. But you decide that everything you've done in the working directory since the last commit is garbage. It's an experiment that went badly. You don't want it. Or perhaps you screwed up. You deleted some files. You deleted some contents of a file. And you want back. You want to go back. Um, so you want to essentially throw all the changes in the working directory. But at the same time, you may even decide that a bunch of the commits that you made recently you want to throw out. Okay? So that's where you use git reset hard. So notice this hard uh, parameter here. Git reset without hard just moves the new pointer. Git reset hard also clobbers your working directory to make it uh, match that pointer. So what has happened? is two things. Moving of a pointer, which is harmless. You can always undo it. But the other thing that has happened, every, every change you made in the working directory from D, it's gone. So this is dangerous, but extremely useful. I use it all the time when I say, forget about it. I want to go back to the state where I was at B, including my working directory. And I intentionally want to delete whatever is changed in the working directory. This is what I do, yeah, when I delete a file by mistake. Git reset hard head, it just, um, because I mentioned head instead of B, this pointer doesn't move, stays here, it's just that this becomes D. So I reset to my uh, last commit. When you put a name like B, is that just what you do when you git log and copy paste the most recent commit? Right, so again, Git has a very sophisticated ways for naming commits. You can name them by the first few characters of your hash, and then I copy and paste from a git log. Or you can use some other names if you have names for those commits, other branches. Um, sometimes I give names to commits because I say, I might need to come here later. So let's uh, get, I, I give a name, uh, my old commit, just so that I have a way to, to refer to it. But very often I go to a git log and copy and paste. paste. Uh, over there and then you. Um, after you reset to B, you said that uh, they're not referenced, does that mean you can't reset back to D or C? Uh, it's not referenced, but it's, it's there. There's going to be a way for us to recover this if you want. The day, it's in there in the data structure. It doesn't have a name. But you can't reset back to I can. Oh, you can. Yeah. If I, if I somehow get hold of its uh, hash uh, number, I do a git yeah. reset D, I and I go to it. However, git log won't show it to me. Because git log goes ahead and follows from here down. But somehow, if I scroll back to my window and find its hash number, I get it. I can reset. So git reset without hard just moves this uh, pointer. Hard also clobbers the working directory. 
Okay, let me repeat again. Two changes have been made. One is this pointer. You can always undo that. Because stuff in the repo you can undo. This stuff is lost forever. Whatever you have in the working directory. Which is sometimes what you want. Um, okay. Moving along. So this answers your get hard uh, reset hard question. Wait. If the commits C and D are not lost, then is there any really irreversible change in the working directory? Yes, in the working directory, notice it's F here. After I committed to D, I made some more changes. Let's say I deleted the file by mistake. This is lost. Okay, so F is lost. F is lost. Okay. D and C are not lost. That's why I say you may lose stuff in your working directory, but stuff that you committed, it's always there. Even if you happen to mess up your references to point somewhere else, it's still there. So this git reset hard equal to um Uh, I'll get to check out in a little bit, but no, not quite. <coughs> almost, almost, um, because git checkout will refuse to delete a working directory. So I cannot check out because you have something different there. So you'll have to start deleting by hand to be able to check out. But it's almost the same. And this actually brings me to using branches. Okay, what are git branches and what to use them for? Okay, first, the name branch in Git is a misnomer. Uh, a branch is really an entry in this table. It's a name. It should be a Git name. Okay, but here's the scenario. You, uh, you have just committed D, and uh, you're on branch new, and you want to create another reference to B. You, you want to add an entry to this table. Okay, so there's a slight mistake on the slide here. This all should not be. In the initial state, you'll just have a, uh, a name called new. Um, you want to create a new name in the table, add a name to the table to point to B, or to any other place in your graph that perhaps you have the, the hash of. Okay? And the reason you may need that is for lots of things. Let's say you want to give a name so that you don't have to remember the hash number. You may want to come back to it. You may want to compare to it. For any command that refers that, um, that hash B, that's more convenient <laughs> if I give it a name. Okay? It is also used to start a branch, but that's just one of the use cases of creating a ref. The command is called git branch. But all that git branch does, it adds an entry to this table with a reference to the commit that you made. And if I say git branch old new, it would point to the same thing. I'll have two names for the same commit D. Only one is the current branch, the one that's pointed by head. But you can have multiple names pointing to the same thing. Okay? But notice, this doesn't create any branch per se. It's just setting a little pointer in the table. Okay? Questions? However, it's the first step into creating a branch. Perhaps you gave this a name because you want to build on top of B, to essentially grow a branch at that point. Uh, and this actually brings me to check out. Check out, uh, the scenario here is that, let's say you have two names, two branches, let's call them. Uh, but they're really just two names. D is the current branch and matches the working directory. And you've just committed your work uh, in D, and you want to switch to work on top of B, perhaps because this is corresponds to the code you released last week, and maybe you need to make a change to the release of last week without including all of the stuff you've done since. Okay? Uh, so you do a git uh, check out, and then you name the commit that you want to check out, or the branch. Most often, it's important here, uh, if this is the name of a branch as opposed to the name of a commit, it will also set this to be the current branch. So two things happen. Notice the working directory now becomes B. So this is what most people understand by checking out code. You copy from the repo into the working directory. But the other thing happened is this thing. Edge here. Head now points to all. All becomes the current branch. So checkout does two things. Uh, and again, in case it's not clear, everything on the left of the slide is before. <coughs> everything on the right of the slide is after, including this, this pointer is after, this pointer is before. Okay? If I, I can have multiple names for this B, I could check out all of those names, the working directory will be the same B. It's just the difference is what becomes the current branch. 
The current branch is important when you make a commit because remember a commit is always on top of head. So head points to old, so old will advance if I make a commit now. Questions? Okay, so you've now switched on another branch. If you run git log, it looks like head, and this is gonna do a log from here down. Let's say that now you have this, uh, this configuration, old is the current branch, new point somewhere else, you've made some changes, so the working directory is E, and if you commit now, E will be added as a new snapshot, new node, and it's gonna be uh, on top of B, because B is the current, uh, is the current branch. Okay? So if you commit now, Notice how E becomes the, uh, this is the new node, the parent is B because B was the old head. And notice how old advanced. This is important. When you commit, only the current branch advances, even though you may have multiple, uh, multiple things pointing to the parent that you're committing on top of. Only the current branch advances. Okay? If you keep in mind, essentially, uh, what these pointers do, typically you don't have many branches that you work with. But if you keep uh, in mind how they work, it's, uh, it's going to be very helpful. And again, if you make a mistake, you can always undo your work by just using git branch to reset this name somewhere else. Questions? Okay, moving along. So uh, we have learned how to um, Create a branch. Creating a branch, a branching structure, really has two steps. First, you give a name to the point where you are growing the branch somewhere in history, and then you start. You check out that name to make that the current branch, and then you start committing there, and then uh, things grow. And then at some point, now that your work is committed, working directory is the same as that. You can do a git checkout new. And then head will point to new because new is the current branch. Working directory will be set to D. And then you keep growing up here. Okay? So these are the typical steps that, that you do. Uh, so let's spend a few minutes on uh, how you use branches. What I showed you so far is the mechanics of what Git internally does to its data structure. But there's multiple ways to make use of this. And some of them are actually pretty fundamental to how you develop work and how you collaborate. So let me first ask you why you uh, felt a need for branches in, uh, in the past. Why you would even use this kind of branching structure in the history? How many of you have used branches? All of you, right? Didn't we have part one, part two, part three in Smile? Okay, so all of you have used branches. And the question, I guess, is too easy. So if like some team is working on something and you want to work on one feature of it, you don't want to mess up whatever they're working on, you can make a branch. Right. So make a branch to isolate your work from another team uh, because you do want to commit, take advantage of Git, but you don't want your commits to pollute their their work. And then when you know your stuff is working. When you know your stuff is working, there's going to be a way to kind of bring it together. Yes. Um, other reasons for using branches? Okay, so sometimes we use a branch because we're all working on something and we decide that this is a release candidate. It has all the features, we think it works, but we need to give it to the testing team. The testing team has to have, can't have a moving target, so we have to give them something. So we give that a name, which is git branch, just gives it a name, and if the testing team finds bugs that are really urgent to fix for that release, those bugs get grown on that release branch. But that's typically very little traffic there, generally. The development goes on on the main one. It's another way to isolate uh, work. OK, so let's see what list uh, of uh, uh, use cases I have here. You need to fix a bug in the previous version. Temporary or private versions uh, to is isolate uh, changes. Again, snapshot of code for, uh, for testing. Um, separate branch for custom release. Sometimes you have a customer that wants something change that only they need that change. You don't want to mix it up with everybody's code. That's very rare, but if the customer pays well, you're going to change that feature just for them. Um, so we've seen how you create branches. 
And people say that, oh, Git makes branching easy. Uh, well, truly, all version control systems that are used nowadays uh, make branching easy. Um, so that's not really special to Git. But uh, the way, the place where branching starts to become a headache is not when you diverge. Because diverging isolates. And then whatever you do there doesn't affect anybody. It's when you try to bring stuff together, merging. That's when uh, you get into, into headache. So the scenario for merging is that uh, you've made progress. This is your main project. One of your coworkers has checked out version B. And while you were busy making changes for C and D, they built, uh, they made this change E. But they made it on top of B because that's how they started. Maybe this was a year, uh, a day ago. Okay. So now you want to incorporate their changes into the main project, or to bring them in into the new branch, as opposed to the uh, old branch. Okay. And so th there are several ways of doing that. Uh, one is called a merge. Okay. And the merge. Uh, so you are in the new branch. You are here. Um, and you're pointing to D, and you say git merge old, old points to E. It would be equivalent to say git merge E. So essentially, you want to say what this does, it's actually a very complicated uh, command. It, it will first say, OK, I'm at new, and they want to merge old. Let's find the common ancestor of new and old. So it goes back to the history to find B as the place where these two uh, branches have diverged. And then it says, I want to bring in here all the changes from the common ancestor to E. Because the changes below, I already have. I need what from here on. Okay? So Git will create this uh, new commit with two parents, the two uh, sides of the merge. And uh, the first parent is D, and uh, the other parent is the one that you're referring to the merge. The other thing that will happen, because this is a new commit in your branch, your current branch new advances to F, and the working directory is also changed to F. So that's quite a bit. Okay, finds these differences, figures out how to put them together, then creates a commit, and then checks out that commit in the working directory. All this in one go. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of, um, I have a few slides here to describe some of the intricacies of merge. Let me not start on those, uh, on those right now. Uh, say it again. Are you going to talk about merge conflicts? Merge conflicts, and I have a fairly principled way of how to think about when, what the correct merge is uh, that I think is going to be helpful uh, for you to remember. But let, let's start with that uh, next time. So we went about halfway through the presentation. I have a bunch of more slides with more advanced features for next time. So in the rest of today's uh, lecture, why don't you open up the lecture feedback page. Again, go to the class web page. On the lower left, there's a lecture feedback. And you please uh, file your feedback for today uh, before the end of the lecture slot. <coughs>